This is the power of change, transformation, destruction. This is the power of creation. I had few friends who were like, we want to try Tantra. And I could see that what they want to do is get laid. Your wife is right there. We could lay you on the ground right now. And within five minutes, she can put you into beautiful states, energetic states. She's excited. So angry like monks. What mantra are you saying before you're having a tantric sex? Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Soul to Soul. My guest today is Shiva Rajaya. And Shiva is a practitioner of Tantra for more than 30 years. And he's teaching Tantra for the last 20 years. Shiva, welcome. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. So, what is Tantra? That's yeah, a good question. So, <clears throat> there's a big distinction between what Tantra is and what is being exposed out there in the world, right? So, if I summarize it to just a couple of concepts, Tantra for me is a complete path of life mastery. Imagine already in ancient times, also within the classical Tantra, that you have masters and teachers that want to teach the world how to be a better embodied human being, how to optimize, how to uh, deal with food, how to deal with, uh, you know, society, how to uh, embody all the different aspects of our lives in ways that are optimized. So for me, this is what it is. It is a complete path of life mastery, but it's not just a personal development. It is a mystical path of life mastery. So that's the, the first frame, the complete path of life master. Okay. The second frame is a complete path of awakening. We want to wake up, right? We want to uh, go beyond the limits of the matrix, beyond the limits of the, the, the constructs of society and reconnect to source, right? So the field of Tantra is a path of awakening as well. And what is awakening? Like for people who are not in the spiritual realm, what is awakening or what do you mean by matrix, I guess? So matrix, you saw the movie, right? Yeah. Uh, so we live in a construct, we live within the field of four dimensions of time and space, right? Three dimensions of space and then one dimension of time. And this is what we call reality, physical reality. But then when we enter into the fields of the energetics, for instance, right, like right now, we look through our physical senses and we believe that our bodies are separate entities, yeah. right? It's like, there is you and there is me and we're separate. But then when we go into quantum physics or into shamanic um, shamanism, then we discover that we are not that separate. In fact, physical matter is like 99% emptiness, right? And that right now, as we are having these conversations, our minds and our spirits are interacting with each other. Yeah. It means that my words are impacting your field, your words are impacting my field. As we make eye contact, there is some magic that is waking up, right? Yeah. And so what, what we do right now is entering from the fourth dimension to fifth dimension of energy. We activate energy. That's the first la layer of awakening. It's like for somebody who suddenly has a mystical experience, suddenly they, they feel connection with nature, right? They feel connection with the world. They feel suddenly sensations and feelings of love for everything and everybody. So suddenly that's entering to fifth dimension. So for me, that's the first layer of awakening. It's like suddenly realizing, oh my God, you know, a tremendous state of presence. The second layer of awakening is once we connect to source beyond that. I call that six dimension and six dimensions connection to source. So in the six dimension, my belief is that we've got angelic forces, powers, we've got gods and goddesses, we've got alien life forms. We have like a lot of things happening in the invisible and we are only one of 12 creative hierarchies on this planet. Okay. It means that there is way, way more happening behind the veils of the limits of our senses that we cannot see and we cannot perceive. But how do we know it exists? <laughs> exactly. So it's, uh, you know, how do we know it exists? There is faith. There is like the belief system, you know, probably 80% of people on this planet believe in the, in the power of some form of greater intelligence, right? God or the universe. Even when we work with the law of attraction, we go like, oh, yeah, we call the universe. We go like, okay, what is the universe? Is it conscious? Is it intelligent? And so on, right? 
So the only thing that we can do when we engage into that, the, into those realms, we cannot engage in it in a scientific way. Okay. Unless we access it through, through uh, you know, quantum physics, for instance, and then we find laws and and principles along that line. We engage into it with intuitive research. Intuitive research, it means we are guided by intuition. We are guided, we try certain things. For instance, if you and I sing a mantra together, and then you go like, oh, that feels really good. Why do I feel good? Maybe there is a response from something. Something is happening or being accessed. So over the last, uh, you know, 30 years of my journeys and mystical experiences, all that, I tested things. I go like, let's see what happens if I, if I hold this weapon in my hand, you know, oh, and I hold it and I meditate with it. Does it work? Does it change my frequency? What about this? You know, if I wear it, am I a different person than if I don't wear it? How does this impact my field, right? How does this impact you? Tell me about the weapon and, and this, because I don't wear a lot of things, but I see people who are more spiritual, they have a lot of attributes. Yeah. Like you have a whole bunch of things on you. I've so, got lots of things on you. You've got tattoos, right? Yes. Yeah. So the tattoos tell a story. Yeah. And you've got this, just this little, you know. Yes. Yeah. Ceremo uh, Bali ceremonial. Uh, exactly. You read the temple. Yeah. Do you believe that your frequency changes if you take it off? I haven't taken it off for four months, so I don't know. Exactly. But there is a reason why you keep it. Yeah. I mean, so a part of you believes that it gives you some form of blessing and protection. Yeah. Right? And so the tattoo that you have on your forearm over here, look at that. This is a lot of magic right there. You have a triangle, you have a channeling of energy. Did you design it or did somebody design it for you? Uh, I designed it, yeah. You designed it. So you channel something yes. that is freaking incredible. Yes. It's like the whole design and everything tells a story, right? Yeah. We could talk probably about, about it for an hour or two hours, just about this tattoo, the eye in the center. Hey, look at that. We've got a triangle and we have an eye. Yeah. We never met before, right? You know, We're tuning into the same kind of symbology and then you have the planets over there and then... There's a rocket, so there's yeah, a compass, there's a bunch of things. So a lot of things. So, But how does this change your frequency when you wear it? How do you feel? What does so, it make you feel? This one? Yeah. Yeah, over here. This is called the Trishula, right? And it's the power of change, transformation, and destruction. So what I believe is this. It is that when I'm wearing it, I'm activating and channeling that power inside of me to create space. If I hold this, what I'm saying is I activate freedom in my field. This is a trishula, right? A trident. If I hold it and I activate the, the power of this by holding it and by focusing on it or using a mantra to activate it, then what I'm saying is I am free and I want to remove all obstacles, all uh, unsorted or undigested emotions in my field all the traumas, everything that doesn't serve me, I want to go back to a state of freedom. So I'm pulling in, this is used by Shiva or Kali or other gods and goddesses. And I'm saying, I want to be free. And the only way to test if it works is like, you try wearing, wearing something like that for a week and then you take it off. And then you try again and then you take it off. And then you see the, the, the change. Sometimes I, I sleep and I sleep with all of that on me. Well, and then sometimes I remove it, and then during the night I start having like strange nightmares coming in or things happy appearing in my field that don't appear when when I'm wearing it. So it's just testing by experience. Yeah, you know, you test test it out and see see if that that works for you. You're talking about matrix, and the thing that we live in a matrix is a very popular belief for many people. Yes, but what is I guess. For people who are not familiar with that, why are we calling that the matrix? Why the reality that we have now is not real? Why we're saying that something else right there is more real than what we see? Um, for me, it's not being more real or less real. Yeah. It's just different frequencies of okay. existence. So the physical reality right now, we have been trained and conditioned as a human race, as human beings to function with our five senses first. Right, so this is the reality we live in. It's a fantastic reality. The way it's portrayed in, in the movie, 
it's very doomed and very, you know, it's not my experience. Yeah. I love being in a physical body. I love my physical senses. I love that. And I love also being able to transcend that and tap into something that my physical senses cannot perceive. Listen. And so everybody over here in Bali is doing breath work, right? Yes. So that's a good example. Yes. Why do we do breath work? Is that because when we breathe and bring awareness to the present moment, there is something that happens in our pineal gland and something in our bodies where suddenly channels of energy are being activated that makes us feel a little bit more alive, right? There is more energy into our system. But we activate the Shakti, we activate the life force and so on. So it's like playing with those different realities and those different frequencies is like, yeah, navigating it from a, from a place of, um, of curiosity and, and see what happens when we, when we activate those different yeah. forces, right? But for instance, right now, you and I were having a physical conversation. We could totally close our eyes and enter into different states of being by meditating together, for instance, or by engaging in other practices, sing a mantra or, you know, something else. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we should sing a mantra, but not yet. Uh, let, me, yeah. let, let me ask you a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, the, one, the one stigma, I guess, about Tantra that I want you to unveil, if it's a stigma, yeah. is that Tantra is all about sex. Yeah. People who don't know anything about Tantra, when you say Tantra, Tantric Retreat, oh, they're just an orgy. That's how they call it, which probably many times it is so, yeah. but many times it's not. So what is the distinction between Tantra and sex and what role does sex play in Tantra? Yes, beautiful. So I believe that sexual energy and sexual practices are part of the Tantric field, uh, but they represent a fraction of what is there. So imagine that the spirit of Tantra, like this giant, God or goddess or entity has been evolving over the last 3,000 years, right? And at some point in, in our human evolution, maybe 1,500 years ago, it incarnates itself to certain teachers and masters. They have those scriptures. This is classical Tantra. It's everything that happened in, uh, until the 20th century, maybe. Before that, this is classical Tantra, right? So in the, the Neo-Tantra movement, imagine that the spirit of Tantra keeps evolving. It's, it permits everything. It's not just located in, in India. It arrives in the Western world and it goes like, I am a compassionate being. I want to help humankind, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine that this is the way it works. And then this being looks at, at the Western world. It says, you guys are having lots of pain around sex. There is lots of, lots of um, unspoken traumas and disturbances and things. Why don't we try to harmonize that together? Right, so the spirit of Tantra incarnates itself and brings certain teachers into the world, and then suddenly there is a whole new wave of teachings that is being activated. So for the 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 the, the classical Tantra teachers, they say, "Oh, this is not the real thing." You know, we we are going to discredit that and uh, position it as just some form of sensual and sexual gratification that has nothing to do with the origins of Tantra. Uh, in my experience, that's not the case at all. It's like if we engage into tantric practices, sensual or sexual practices, uh, something is going to open up in our fields that we would not tap into otherwise. That is very, very healing for humankind. That represents one of the stepping stones in our evolution. So, of course, there are forces, gods and goddesses and spirits and, and intelligence that are working to us to bring new teachings. Yeah. Teachings are not crystallized. You know, the fact that we can only use what was channeled 1,500 years ago is completely crazy. Yeah. It's like, this is why you have modern teachers like Osho, when he, he appears into the world, he says, we're going to give you what you need the most right now. This is where you're suffering. This is what we're going to create for you. So to put that into perspective, I believe that some of the Neo-Tantra teachings are very shallow, very, very shallow, that they don't go deep enough that I'm over there and I'm like, you know, not really interested by what's happening. So I come from a background where I went to the Himalayas, spent lots of time in caves. I'm first a mystic. But then when it comes to sexual energy, I say, I want to do something with my sexual energy. Yeah. Let's just be there like, oh, I don't want to hear about you. I, you know, I want to suppress it. No, on the contrary. I go like, I have a, I have a woman in my life, which is beautiful. It's like we can merge, we can create experiences that are incredible together by using the sexual energy, right? I was listening to the podcast you did with Natasha. Yeah. And she was saying 
that how do you bring Tantra to beginners? And then you gave this example that, well, imagine that we meet, we touch. She was very into that. She was like, oh, Shiva, <laughs> tell me more. We touch, then we go. In general, we like, we have sex, and then that's it. But if you do Tantra, then you have some spiritual and divine experiences together with that. So imagine I'm like a fly on a wall in that room where you and your girlfriend is doing some Tantra, Tantra, yeah. whatever you call it. So what would I see? If I look into it, how would that be different from just having sex and how or making love? Yes, yeah, beautiful. So when, when I engage into these practices, I call them tantric sex. I don't just call them tantra. Yeah. I call them tantric sex to make it more specific and to make a distinction with just like everything that has to do to be yeah. tantric. So what it would look like, the first thing it is that the intention with which we engage into the connection is very different than just sensual grat gratification and just passionate sex. The intention is we are going to open a temple together. We are going to open a space where we are going to offer our connection as a divine prayer, as a sacred prayer. So the intention is completely different. It's like you activate uh, a sense of devotion and resonance by inviting forces that are bigger than ourselves. It's not just two people. We sing mantras, we activate, we have the temple, we have the sacred geometry, we have like a whole lot of elements that are present in the space that give a sacred dimension to the space. And then if you see us engaging into uh, beautiful lovemaking, from outside it might look very similar. You'll be like, wow, you're caressing each other, kissing, uh, having intercourse, you know, all of these things might look like the same, but the quality of the experience is going to be different. Exactly in the same way as if we do breath work, you might be breath work as a, as a therapeutic thing, as a shamanic thing. It has different connotations, right? Even though outside it looks the same. Somebody who goes to a, to a gym and might do some stretches, you go like, wow, that looks like yoga, but it's not yoga, yeah. right? It's not yoga. Why is not yoga? Because it's not a prayer. The moment we add the mantras, we add the sequences, then we add an intention that is different. So that's, the, that's probably the core, the core element. But what do you, how, how is your feeling different? Let's say if I would say, Shiva, I really want to learn Tantra, but I, I want you to sit a tantric sex because Tantra and tantric sex are different. But what is the difference for me, somebody who starts learning tantric sex when I, when I go and I do it, what do I feel? How do I feel differently? What does it change in me? Yes. It's a beautiful question. Uh, it changes in you because the experience of sex will become way, way more profound. The, the sensations of connection with your partner are going to be way, way deeper. Instead of being like, okay, I ha I'm feeling pleasure. I love you. You're fantastic. You're beautiful. You're going to look at your woman and be like, oh my God, I'm seeing the, the divine. I'm seeing things or having sensations that expand my energetic and emotional potential beyond the fields or beyond the experiences that I had, uh, I had before. So you might think, okay, well, this is really complicated to access. It's super simple. Yeah. It's like once you understand, you sing a couple of mantras and you make eye contact with your partner, you engage into activating the full dimension of your being first before making physical contact. It means that like you're going to breathe, you are going to shake, you are going to use mantras, you are going to release the tension in your body so that the full dimension of your body is engaged. So your body becomes an erogenous zone by itself. It's not focused necessarily on the genitals. You can focus on the genitals. You can focus on uh, lingam and yoni massage. You can do all these things. But the first step is to connect energetically. Yeah, I heard about full body orgasm. Yes. That people experience when they yeah. go into Tantra, not just orgasm in one place, but just like prolonged full body orgasm. Exactly. So when, when you have a full body orgasm, it doesn't need to be tantric. It's like sometimes you have people who are going to be engaging into conscious sexual experiences and who are going to open those, those pathways. The full body orgasm is, uh, it's almost like a biological or an energetic thing that can happen to many people who are not even connected to Tantra, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a physical or energetic, energetic thing. The mystical experience that we're talking about of feeling like accessing the codes and creating, activating the sacred temple is a, is a very different um, vibration and, and experience than the traditional just friction sex that you might have with, with a partner. I see, I see. And, uh, you know, all of it is beautiful. Yeah. It's just like 
if you are having sex and having connection with a partner and you could be like, mm, something is missing. I feel like there is more, but I don't know how to access it. Then tantric sex might be the, you know, uh, an openness uh, that will give, give a whole new set of channels and possibilities. Okay. I don't know if that's a stereotype. If I'm saying it, it's a stereotype, correct me if I'm wrong. But from what I see, people who practice and teach Tantra, they're often engaged in open relationships, have many partners, and this is very normal in Tantric community. How, I guess, how, how does your sex life or love life look like? And is that something that you practice as well? Yes. So um, there are two things, right? There is polyamory an open relationship, and then there is Tantra. Yeah. And sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. Like right now, most of my friends who are teaching me in the field of the Tantra, they're in committed relationships. They don't open their relationship anymore. Yeah. So there has been waves, you know, probably like, I would say 10, 15 years ago, everybody was in open relationships. Now the trend is everybody tends to be much more in committed relationships. Interesting. And um, for, for people who are beginners in that field, uh, and uh, very often the, the possibility of being there in open containers and being able to explore is something that is attractive attractive to them. For myself, I've been in a committed relationship most of my life. I've been uh, exclusive. Over here in Bali, I had quite a few uh, relationships. Uh, one of them was really open from the start. We decided to open and six or seven other relationships were completely, absolutely committed. And uh, I feel like the moment we open the relationship, uh, there is a lot of instability that comes into the field. It's very challenging for the average person to create a container that is safe for both partners and open the relationship. I see. I would say that there is probably a 5% of people on this planet who are equipped, emotionally equipped to navigate open relationships. It's like the, the challenges and what comes into the field is just like, very, very difficult or challenging to navigate. So when we are in, for instance, in Tantra retreats and, and there is more openness around that, um, then uh, very often the container is going to create, uh, you know, an extra safety for, for that. But what I want, I want us to remember here is that Tantra and polyamory, Tantric sex and polyamory, they are two separate things. They, they seem to overlap, but in reality, they are two very, very different things. My belief right now is that if you want to dive deep into tantric sex, it's better to focus your energy on one person and create a safety within that container. And then somewhere down the line, if at some point you want to open the relationship, it might be possible. But trying to do that from the start when you don't have the tools, yeah. when those skills are not established, is very, very challenging. It's not something that I would encourage. I see. I feel, and maybe it's my feeling, but I had few friends who were like, we want to try Tantra. Yes. And I could see that what they want to do is get laid. Yes. But they say that they want to try Tantra. So I think that just the stigma around it invites people who want to have sex or might not have enough sex. Yes. And I don't know if it's good or bad. I, I don't know. There's people still, maybe through that, it changes them and they become more connected. Yeah. But I think that probably, correct me if I'm wrong, like 50, 60% people who go into Tantra, their intention is not get connected, but more like to have fun partners and participate in orgies, have some sex, even though Tantra and polyamory is a different thing. Exactly. So what, you, what you're pointing out is, is true. I feel that, uh, but if we look at the, the impulse and the desire, what is the profound desire? The profound desire is to go back to a state of oneness. It's like through sex, we connect with somebody and then we're going to have beautiful experiences, even if, if it's through pleasure. We live in a world which has been so conditioned and so frustrating in terms of waking up. You know, you, you go to school and you are in, in businesses and you work eight hours a day. And so where's the fun? Where's the pleasure? Where's the, the place where we can access that? So pleasure is secret. By itself, somebody wants to experience uh, have deeper and more pleasurable sexual experiences, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. It's like, if it's done within the context that is safe for both partners, then that's a beautiful thing. Right now, uh, the world is sexually frustrated. There is a lot of, of distortion, so many shadows around the field of sex. And so we need to have some form of teachings and some form of energy that is going to, to teach us how to do that better. My guess is that probably, you know, 
many of the decisions that are made on a planetary level are made because people are frustrated. <laughs> you know, it's like you look at politicians, you go like, good sex in your life would change everything. <laughs> you would make very different decisions if you were not constantly bitter and anger. Because it would circulate the energy, it would make you feel great, it would make you feel healed. And um, yeah, and... Um, what? But the, 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 you know, the core element is that it is that as a human race, the level of optimization of our sexual energy is maybe at 20%. Yeah. It's like we are not performing really well. There is lots of rape, lots of abuse, lots of traumatic experiences, couples, marriages that, that stick together, but, but really frustrating. And even, uh, you know, and so uh, all of that creates like this field of shadows around sex. And what we're trying to do is harmonize that field in whatever whatever way we can and uh sometimes we make mistakes sometimes we try something and we be like okay well uh, you know maybe 10 people orgy is not my thing <laughs> say it again Some, somebody tries something they're like maybe 10 people orgy is not my thing i'll just exactly. just go back to commit relationship yeah and uh, we can what uh, what i would encourage people to do is like well really slowly yeah. try something and then if it's for you you keep on going but the, the, the moral superiority of trying to, to lock certain things and shame certain things or certain behaviors, you know, think about tribal behaviors. You know, like right now, I'm not participating in, in orgies or group sex, but if people love that, they go like, why not? Find out what works for you and, and then uh, explore it and create safety around that without abusing other people's freedoms and other people's, or putting other people's health in danger, for instance. Yeah. Go like, try it out, you know, if it's, if it's your thing. Why do you think there's so much shadows around sex? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I believe it's very ancestral. I think it comes from a place where um, at some point, you know, before Moses, before the, the modern religions, I believe that uh, we probably were having lots of sex. Like a little bit like the, the baboons, right? Not too much to do, right? You hunt, yeah. you fuck, and you have fun. What's, what's the, the, the monkeys that are... Um, that are you know, using sex all the time. Some, uh, you know, like the chimps, but uh, it's a it's a different brand or different species. Anyway, they are solving everything to sex. So we, as a human race, probably we were having a lot of sex and society was not growing from there. It's like if, you, if we have full freedom to go into sexual practices, maybe we would have sex all the time. We would be like, oh, you know, it would be just a, a natural thing to do. So my belief, what happens is that at some point, the society was very messy. Children would be born. We didn't know who the father was. We didn't know where they came from. The, it was like this mix of energies. And at some point when we started developing agriculture and, and starting to organize society, then we needed a little bit of order around that. So suddenly you have Moses who comes to the Mount, Mount Sinai and he goes like, you shall not commit adultery. If, if you do that, you go against the will of God. Right? So we are going to restrict sex just within marriage. We're going to put that within within a very specific channel. And so what happens from now on is that anybody who doesn't follow that rule then commits a sin and it becomes a taboo. It becomes cheating. It becomes breaking the divine law, right? And so it's just one step further than everything that doesn't happen within the context of, of marriage, sexual marriage, uh, then um, it becomes a shame, it becomes taboo, it becomes something that becomes hidden, a shadow. Even if the impulse is still there, the desire is still there and becomes shadow. Then all the shadows, you know, rape, cheating, all that stuff starts emerging. And, uh, you know, you might have a woman who is no longer in love with her partner, still has to do to have sex with her partner because this is the divine law somehow. So it contradicts natural instincts. And so, you know, we fast forward two, three thousand years further, this stuff is still stuck in our system. And um, so it's, it's very, yeah, it's very challenging to navigate it nowadays because those traumas are still uh, imprisoned in the, in the collective. And it doesn't come only from Christianity or Judaism. It comes from, you know, most major religions are going to have some form of, hang on, guys, just hold back, you should know, uh, and try to, uh, to shame anything that has to do with nudity, with sexual behaviors, with all that stuff. And uh, I believe that, yeah, we're ready for an embrace. We're ready to, to change the stories a little bit, uh, one step at a time, you know, slowly, but yeah, open up a little bit in the field, see what the shadows are and, and fear it with all that.
Yeah, I think that's very interesting that people live their life and do whatever they like to do. And then one guy comes and say, no, this is the rule. They're yep. not going to do what you're doing. As one of my friends said that King still had concubines. He just like mostly regular people yes. lived in a rule of law. But if you create a law, you don't have to live by the law. I believe that, uh, you know, prophetic impulse is like everything that came through the channeling of of you know, the divide and all that is really powerful. It comes at moments where you, you, uh, humankind needs that. And, uh, but then it gets crystallized in a certain form. We say, that's it. That's, there is no other truth. And you say, but truth can evolve. Sometimes it's appropriate for a certain given time in our human history. And then that law doesn't make sense anymore, but it's still there. Yeah. Because we, we don't have, you know, nowadays, if there was a modern prophet coming into existence, maybe the, the script and the narratives would be very different than what, previous prophets have been saying yeah. uh, around certain, you know, certain things. And, uh, you know. <laughs> it's interesting for me how in Balinese culture and many other cultures, to some degree, nudity means disrespect. So if you're nude somewhere where you shouldn't be, if you go nude in a church, they'll say, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You're disrespecting. But how can I, my pure self, the expression of my pure self is just me. I'm just wearing the clothes for you guys not to feel uncomfortable, yeah. so to say. We're just playing this game. You're wearing clothes, I'm wearing clothes for everybody to feel sort of comfortable. Yeah. Which is funny, but when we take it out of we who we are, yeah. our initial self, yeah. that is disrespect. Yeah. To me, it's very interesting. I think it's, it's really important to be, to be personally respectful to the, the cultures in, in which we live. I call that collective person, right? And yeah. so it's like try to feel what people can take. I have been conditioned in a certain way, but not everybody has been conditioned in the same way. So instead of uh, of being like trashing something in people's faces, you were like, "How do you feel about that?" You say, "Oh, that makes you comfortable." Pray it. Then we are going to keep it within a within a context or within um, a way of relating that that feels comfortable yeah. Yeah, to uh, to you. And uh, I think it's pretty natural, you know. Precisely, it evolved in a certain forms for certain reasons. Yeah. Like at some point, nakedness is no longer appropriate. You go to the jungles and you see these naked tribes and you're like, they seem to be happy. Yeah. Why are we doing the same? Yeah, it's like there is certain constructs. They are there to, to stabilize society in a certain way. Um, and uh, I think the core the core element is to have respect for each other, you know, respect for each other's cultures. We arrive with King Bali for us. It's really, really important to respect the, the traditions of the Balinese and the an Indonesian culture and be like, okay, well, we want to be here so that we can really connect with each other and uh, have a have a language and, and and habits and behaviors that honor, you know, each other's each other's cultures. I percent agree. Yeah. I think you need to do what makes you need to play at the play field where you're at. If people are uncomfortable, don't go naked. It just as an observer, to me it's always funny to see how we put meaning to certain things. Yes. But like absolutely. being naked means that you're shaming somebody. Exactly. And for me, that's like, there definitely was a lot of trauma around this as a result of people like myself. If I see a naked person, I feel uncomfortable myself. So it's not just, exactly. for me, it's example as well. I want to talk about masculinity as well. Yes. And your Instagram, there's a lot of interesting content. You talk about men's circle and masculinity. Um, there's a lot of discussion about crisis of masculinity that masculinity right now challenged in so many ways. Yes. How do you see that? That's a good question. It is, a, again, starting to, to rediscover uh, ways of being a, a male on this planet. What does it mean when it comes to, to expressing our, you know, male behavior or masculinity? What is it that uh, the planet, our partners, humankind needs the most? And right now, what, what I notice is that on a planetary level, there is a crisis, for instance, in leadership, right? I have the feeling that uh, the way we live and the structures in which we live are, are very corrupted. You know, governments and, and uh, businesses as well, they, they are leading us into directions that I feel are creating uh, control and lack of freedom and constricting the, the human dignity, right? So... Who is doing that? You know, very often it's like, oh, it's the patriarchy or is this, it means that there is a potential for us to evolve as, as men. For instance, if you and I were relating, we can enter into competitive patterns, right? 
can be, oh, your podcast is better than mine, da, 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 you know, and being rivalry or you see. I mean, with your, with who you are, I cannot compete. I'll be honest. But precisely, you see, right right now, what we are what we are doing is straight away starting to synchronize our energies and offering respect and support to each other. It's like I'm here to support you as a brother, and you're here to support my my mission as well. And so what this does is that it removes a whole lot of shame and traumas that were there before. The same, for instance, if if we in our relationships, if I go to my girlfriend and I go like, "You are my wife," you know, you do as I say. You don't look at that guy. What's wrong with you? You know, I get into abusive patterns or behaviors. If I go like, I'm here to defend your freedom. I'm here to, as a protector of yourself. There are certain patterns in my masculinity that are going to be toxic. They are going to be abusive. They're going to be unhealthy, immature, right? And then there is a whole set of patterns which are going to be mature, healthy, evolved, awakened, conscious, intentional, right? So I want to, to dive into that. But, but, if we don't have a, a training system that teaches us how to go from immature to mature, you know, for instance, if I'm having a tantrum and I go like, oh, I'm so angry like now, it's just, oh, you know, and it's constricted in my system. I don't know how to circulate that energy. I want to have pathways on how to express myself without suppressing my rage or my anger, but directing it in a way that is useful for me and useful for the people around me, right? With a feeling feeling like I'm threatening or attacking somebody. So I've got shadows inside of me. I've got shadows. I'm not perfect. Yeah. There are certain things that can be upgraded. So when we come brothers together, we support each other in that evolution. We are going to call each other. We are going to create a brotherhood resonance field that supports our evolution. And, you know, this is the beauty of it because most of the times when, uh, you know, we have men coming and they say, I'm really uncomfortable in presence of other men. Because there is lots of brotherhood trauma, lots of brotherhood wounding, yeah. you know, from a man one time shaming you and being like, oh, you need to, you know, and attacking you or beating you or something like that. Then naturally you develop this, uh, this fear of being around men. And then, so we go like, no, we're going to wipe out the story. Yeah. Now on, we create a different reality where we try to, uh, to show up for each other. So this is within brotherhood circles. But then our masculinity is going to evolve within that context. Yeah. And what we want is like, for say, a set of, of, of codes that I call the integrity codes. It's like 61 qualities that I believe that's what we need in relationships. In brotherhood, we, we need that in, uh, in uh, our romantic relationships. We need that in business. We need that in social circles. Very simple thing like, I want us to be honest. I want us to be transparent. I want us to show up. I want us to be responsive. You know, for instance, today we do a podcast. I show up half an hour later. You go like, I cannot work with that guy. It's a deal breaker straight away. It's part of the, the unspoken agreements that we're going to be responsive and show up for each other. Yeah. Right? Cool. So there is all, all of that within the mass community. We go like, we want to find ways of activating those codes, activate those behaviors that are, you know, mature mass community. There is something like toxic masculinity. Yeah. Yeah. And there is something like healthy masculinity in exactly the same way as there is something that we can call toxic femininity and tox and, and healthy femininity. For sure. Which we don't talk a lot. Huh? There's a lot of talks about toxic masculinity, but not a lot about toxic femininity, which, yeah. which is also a big, big issue these days. Oh, yeah. The challenge I'm having, and hopefully you can guide me a little bit through, through my personal issue for a while i could not have been able to feel emotions so i know how why does it happen but i when i talk about emotions it's like glass of sparkling water on the table where it's like we're there for a while and you're drinking and you don't know if it's sparkling or not anymore yeah so i'll be like happy with my I understand i'm happy but i would not feel full happiness yeah or i would be like even like screaming at somebody but inside, I would be like, why am I screaming? I'm not really angry. Yeah. And for me, that was a big challenge because at some point, my emotions got diluted. They were like, again, like sparkling water. Somebody put too much water in it and you don't know if it's sparkling or not. Yeah. So have you faced that before? And if so, how would you navigate something like that? Of you not being able to access your emotions. Yeah. So... First thing we have to understand when there is a shadow like this, that's a shadow, right? That's a, that's something that you want to develop and you don't know why it's there. 
is to understand the source. Step number one, you already know that something is there, that there is a potential that, you, that you're not expressing in it. The second thing to understand is where, the, where does it come from? Why is it like that? It's like, were you born like that? Were you born with uh, an inability to feel or an uh, inability to access the same emotions? What do you think? No. No. As a child, you were able. So yeah. what happened between you being a child and, and today's well? What happened? So we have, but I don't know. That's a good question. I well, try to think about, but like a lot of trauma, I guess. And uh, education, conditioning. Yeah. What, what do you do when you go to school? What does a, a, a normal school day for 95% of kids in this family look like? You have to sit silently, raise your hand only when you're asked to. And yeah. Is it okay to scream? No. No, it's not okay to express your emotions. What is the focus, the point of focus in the body uh, in, in teachings most of the times? The head? In the head. Yeah. We think. Yeah. We learn facts. There is no emotion involved in that. It's like, yeah, we can be, you know. So you fast forward, you have 20 years of education in a classroom, sitting down, thinking, suppressing your emotions. And then, you know, you're now 40? Yeah, 35, yeah. Yeah. So you, you are now, you fast forward to today's world, and then you're like, I don't know what happened to my emotions. That's a good point. Your, your whole, the whole design of society is then training you not to feel them. Yeah. I was educated out of feeling. Exactly. You are educating. So reclaiming the emotionals and reclaiming your inner child and reclaiming the playfulness and how to access pleasure and all these things is like, what's the pathway? Luckily, it's not going to take 20, 20 years to reclaim it. It's like, it's, it's actually relatively simple. You just have to start practicing that. And uh, one of the simple ways to, to do that is like to come to presence, to breathe. And then you disconnect from the past, disconnect from the future and you breathe. Yeah. then that's, that's already activating something. When we come into the man's circle, uh, the first thing we do is like we embody, we start shaking the body, we start breathing, activating, we play, we go like, well, you know, into um, gibberish, we are going to do things that are going to release and break the, the we go, get out of your head and into your body. <laughs> yeah. Right? So the more you practice that, the more natural it becomes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very, it's not complex. You just have to, Start moving one step at a time. You get out of your head. You just trust Shiva. Come to the next, next uh, men's circle next week, and you will see that the process of it is super easy. It's yep. all threatening, super safe. I thought I a lost cause. I thought that it's not. Uh, I thought it's, I'm not going to feel again at all. Because at some point I was like, I don't know. I think it's very suppressed. Yeah. And I tried like plant medicine, and I tried all kinds of different things. But so far, nothing, nothing worked. But maybe she was the answer. It's, it's very simple. Your wife is right there. We could lay you on the ground right now. And within five minutes, she, she, she can put you into beautiful states, energetic states where your, your energy starts circulating. Right? <laughs> she's excited. You don't see her face when she's excited. No, through sensuality. It's like, for instance, you can do something else through uh, self-exploration. If you touch your hand right now, and uh, almost the imperceptible. And then you close your eyes, then you focus on the sensations and you go deeper into the sensations. Then very, very, very quickly, yeah. you access that. Or with the sound, you know, in the background, it's just like, you feel the impact on the body. So it's, it's retraining a skill that hasn't been activated. Nobody in, in uh, 15 years of um, school training and education came to you and says, so you've got to get into your body, feel, you know. Yeah. You had to come all the way to wood to discover that. No? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one part of the podcast I have that I haven't done for a while is called Soulful Questions. Soulful Questions. Yes. I love that. Similar questions I ask different guests who come to a podcast. Yes. One of them is, what do you think happens after we die? Um, I believe that our physical body is dissolved. Most of the, the aspects of our personality are being dissolved. And then we go back to, uh, to a unified field of consciousness. But uh, it's very mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure if I believe in reincarnation the way it is being described. I believe that there is some form of reincarnation happening. Uh, I believe that uh, 
the the soul is like a point of connection with different incarnations and that the soul keeps evolving you come as a soul as a seed and the soul is there to remember what is beyond uh beyond the physical reality beyond the egoic vehicle um but it's it's a question that i still have to explore a lot there is yeah. there's only one way to find out for sure <laughs> um well, what's interesting is that, uh, for instance, the Tibetans have uh, meditation practices prepare themselves for the next incarnation. Yeah. So there is like in the spiritual field, uh, yeah, lots of possibilities in there. Beautiful. What are some of the beliefs that they used to hold? It can be a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It can be religious beliefs or beliefs about life, anything that you don't hold anymore. I think that uh, the belief that something's wrong believe that something is wrong with humankind that we are not doing it right that no, 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 you know all the stories all the defeating stories around humankind i believe that we're exactly where we are supposed to be i believe that the angle from where i look at is everything is perfect everything is fine the way it is humankind doesn't need to be rescued the planet is suffering a little bit but it's part of its evolution is like so instead of looking at at things from a doom perspective looking at it from uh, pronoia. Instead of paranoia, is pronoia. Okay. Pronoia is life is giving us exactly what we need to to keep on evolving and moving yeah. forward. And um, another belief system is the the duality between good and bad, uh, good and evil. You know, I believe right now I'm moving way more into a field of non-duality. Where it's just energy is moving. <laughs> no good or bad. Everything is. There is, you know, our our mind and our physical reality see, still makes a distinction. We know the difference between pain and pleasure. Yeah. So there is a distinction, but uh, in the eyes of the divine or sin from above, it's just energy moving. And then sometimes the energy gets blocked. Like for instance, right now, if I press, eventually I'm going to feel pain because there is resistance between two energy realities. The same if you, you and I we enter into an argument, into a fight. And then that's going to feel painful because we are fighting between two energy realities. So the friction is not easy to circulate sometimes. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> it's all, it's just energy moving. For sure. We look at it from that in mind. If you meet yourself, let's say, 20 years ago, what would you tell yourself? Uh, trust and keep moving forward. Everything's okay. So, right. Something's coming up. Yeah. For sure. Go ahead. The I want to ask the last question and I want to talk about some of the things that you brought and sing some mantras. So the question I do like to ask is, according to Shiva, how to live a happy and fulfilling life? Like instead of blaming circumstances, sometimes circumstances are there. You know, you might be in, born in a poor family, all that. The circumstances are there. But there is a lot of what is happening in our lives where we don't self-reflect enough. We go like, I'm going to blame my partner. I'm going to blame my business partner. I'm going to blame the circumstance. I'm going to blame the lack of money or not being healthy or so on. So when we self-reflect, it changes the dynamics a lot because it gives us power to change, shift things. Uh, that's one tip. Another tip that is very important is find a system that works for you. Instead of you trying to navigate and figure out everything by, by yourself, just find out a system, uh, teachers, influence, support group, something that is going to give, accelerate your evolution. Because when uh, I'm doing things by myself in my own isolated cave without having the support of, you know, it's, it's very, it slows down the thing. So uh, we've got tools to accelerate evolution back into the stores. There is no, no shame. Uh, we don't have to be pride and proud about it. It's like, no, just grab this. If you take that rope, it's going to take you the uh, speed up and save you six months of struggle. <laughs> you know, be like, why not? There is a lot of help available right now and find out the systems, the, the, the tools, the people who can accelerate that evolution. Amazing. So tell me about the tools that you brought. We already talked about this beautiful thing. Yeah. So. Summarize very simply, this is the power of change, transformation, destruction. This is the power of creation, right? This is a tool, it's called the Trishula, that was given to Shiva by Indra because he was trying to fight demons and uh, he could not get to, to fight them. And Indra came and said, here, here's this tool. This is going to help you. So, uh, yeah, 
it's the same symbol that uh, is used by Poseidon, right? Yeah. Uh, Neptune in the sea, the god of uh, the god of the oceans in uh, Greek mythology. So we find it in different different places in our human evolution. And uh, for me, I'm wearing it, and it represents the power that I have to to dissolve, you know, the obstacles to remove inside of me what doesn't serve me. And this is a, a vajra. And it's more seen a little bit more within the Tibetan culture, but the, the, the Hindu statues, they have, the, have it as well. And this represents the power of creation. For me, it's the symbol of the lightning as well. And it represents this uh, crack between realities when creation happens. For instance, when a new baby is being born, there is an orgasm that is happening, right? Which is like an electric shock happening in a woman and a man. And then through that electric shock, the semen is being released. And then suddenly there is going to be a moment of magic where a new soul is being born, yeah. right? So it's the same that happens when you have a lightning between uh, the earth and the sky. It's like two polarities and the two of them enter yeah. tension and then suddenly there is a release of energy happening between those two polarities. So this is what I believe how uh, creation, creation works. So we've got those two. Do you so, carry them with you all the time? or No, no, I just brought them today. They, they stay at my temple, but I use them for initiations. Like when somebody wants to, uh, to, um, yeah, to break through certain limitations, then we use the Trishula. Can I? Exactly. Wow. Yeah, I feel the energy. Yeah. It's really interesting that it's like very, wow. Yeah. So this is a power also to access your dark masculine. Okay. Have a, a source of energy inside of you that is not. You can keep it for uh, only for a second. Yeah. So, for instance, if we uh, if we want to activate this this uh, this this weapon, you could be standing up, for instance, or stay right, right there, straight. And then um, the code word that we activate, we use for that, is will be Kala. Kala is a, is a, a one of the archetypes of Shiva, which is for the dark masculine. So when we go Kalaya we call the power of Kala. So you become Kala, you become a divine in incarnation. And then we go Trishulaya. Kalaya, Trishulaya, we're giving to you, to the dark masculine inside of you, we're giving you the power to dissolve whatever trauma, limiting beliefs, whatever might be in your field that is holding you back. We go like, we're going to dissolve all that. We're gonna, you don't need years of talking therapy. <laughs> Should I just say Kalaya, Trishulaya? Kalaya, Trishulaya, Kalaya, Chana, yeah. Kalaya, Trishulaya, Kalaya, Jaya. Ring it with the drums. Kalaya, Trishulaya, Kalaya, Jaya. Kalaya, Trishulaya, Kalaya, Jaya. Kalaya, Trishulaya, Kalaya, Jaya. Kalaya, Trishulaya, Kalaya, Jaya. Yeah. All right. We're all happy. <laughs> and so when when we start activating that, the next step is that you and I become united as as brothers within that field. And so I give you a weapon, right? Yeah. I don't want you to turn that weapon against me. Yeah. We need to have some form of pact of non-aggression, something that enters into the field of resonance. So we are going to to say Kalakula. We are the tribe of dark masculine brothers incarnated. Okay. And we have the power in destruction, change, and transformation. Yeah. So then it becomes Kalakula Trishulaya Kalakula Jaya. Kalakula Trishulaya Kalakula Jaya. You see, that's a profound moment. In the time that we've been spending here together, that's the moment of the greatest intimacy a profound connection that we have. Right now, I'm looking into your eyes and I go like, I see you, I know who you are, I know your power, I honor you, I support you. And now we are activating this, you know, this mission together. What's our mission is like, are you in service to the planet and mankind? Yes. Yes, exactly. That's, that's it. Now we know what we're doing here together. I know what you're doing. And I know that I'm here to support that mission and you are here to support mine. Yeah. Now, what happens on this planet if we do that on a large scale instead of fighting with each other and you build your weapons and I build my weapons and then we ta attack each other's countries? Yeah. It's like, we don't need that. No. We have to focus on, on the targets that are really important for us, right? Yeah. So this is tantric, right? Then we have another symbol over here. 
that many people will know, right? So this is the Ankh cross or the key of life. This is an Egyptian symbol that the gods and goddesses in Egypt, they, they bring to humankind and they are, what does the key do? The key of life, it opens the door, right? Yes. It opens the portal. So it opens the portal for the afterlife. It opens the portal of what's behind the veil. So this is a long, you know, long initiation to go into, but we can, yeah, we can play with that. Oh, well. Wow. I didn't design it as a bell, but eventually it became, yeah. it becomes something. Did you made it yourself? Uh, I had somebody make it for me. Yeah. Yeah, bro. But, uh, yeah, anyway, you get the picture, the sacred yeah. geometry over here of the flower of life. Um, every object tells a story. And uh, sometimes we use words, right? For instance, right now we use kalaya teshula, it represents a certain meaning, but every object tells tells a story as well. Yeah. Right? So what is the mantra you sing before you're having a tantric sex? I guess people will be asking, Anatoly, <laughs> you need to get that code. Yeah. So what, what is the mantra? Shiva for the masculine, Shakti for the perfect feminine, yeah. Shiva, Shakti, Jaya, victory to Shiva and Shakti, and then you uni unite in the heart. Heart is Anahata. Yeah. That's the heart chakra. So if you say Shiva, Shakti, Anahata, Shiva, Shakti, Jaya, then that's going to connect. connect uh, so you sit in front of your partner yeah. and you both for sing that minutes. mantra for five exactly. minutes. And then you have your love. And then uh, then you engage into uh, into soft touch, you engage into breathing together, you engage into maybe shaking if there is tension or something that needs to be released. Uh, another code word is kama. Kama is for sex, yeah. uh, desire, or pleasure, or love. Kamayama means sexual mastery. Yeah. So you heard about pranayama, right? Yes. Pranayama means breath control. Kamayama means... Uh, sexual control or sexual mastery. So when, uh, when you want to activate your profound tantric sex powers, that's the code, code word to activate. So if you say Shiva Shakti Kamayama Shiva Shakti Jaya, you're saying we are the perfect masculine, we are the perfect feminine, and we have the perfect harmonious circulation of sexual energy between us. We are sex masters <laughs> yeah. sexual masters or masters or a sexual energy so anybody can try to hold just sit down for five minutes absolutely say the mantra and yeah. see how you feel uh, it's very easy you know for us if you come with your partner to to my temple then we do a set of practices i give you a sequence and then you practice that and then you you go on uh you can call that tantric dates uh you spend an hour or two hours two or three times a week practicing that until it becomes part of your system and then we are at you know, more techniques, touch awareness and different, different things like that. And, uh, my guess is that your, your, your ability to feel your, your connection with your partner can also be expanded. I'm pretty sure you have a beautiful relationship with your wife, but there is always, you know, space and, and possibilities for expansion. And, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not rocket science. Would you like to be a sex master? I don't know. Maybe not. Huh? I mean, it's not like... Master of sexual energy. It's not like on the top of my list to be a master, but I definitely want to get better at my sexuality. Exactly. Yeah. Because I, I believe at the end, what we want is to be to be masters of our life. We want to be to be able to direct our energies and, you know, develop a, a flow of abundance in all, all aspects of our lives. So it's just a matter of setting up the intention and taking steps, right? Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. Beautiful. Shiva, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for coming. I learned a lot. Uh, yeah. Any parting words to the listeners before yeah. we go? I want to, to say to everybody who will listen to this uh, podcast and uh, has been getting some insights, maybe from what we have been sharing, that um, reach out. Okay, I have um, my my WhatsApp and uh, Instagram and so on. I'm available online for you know, for sessions, but even if you have just one question, I want to interact. I want to know who you are and know where you are at. Uh, that's the first thing. The second one is, um, is, uh, keep searching, keep moving forward. It's like right now there is an abundance and flow of, of energies. The best way to figure out if something is for you is to test the waters. It's not to stay within the comfort zone. It's like 
test a little bit, take one step forward and see if that's a match. And then you come back and then you test something else and then explore the, the, the field of possibilities and keep on moving forward and uh, realize that out there, there is way, way more than, than what the mainstream media and the world is offering us. There is like lots of mysteries and lots of secrets out there ready to be unveiled. So uh, yeah, I'm here to help and to support your evolution. Wherever you are, you are doing great. You are fantastic. You are powerful. And there is way, way more uh, possibilities to come your way. Amazing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Let's share it to more and more people so we all become a sex masters. <laughs> Tantric master. Tantric. Tantric master. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you so you. much for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.